And that is because they are afraid of losing their life of sin. You're listening to Prevailing Word Ministries on the Prevailing Word Podcast channel. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening. Let's pray and then we'll get right into today's message. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word reminds us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished or equipped unto every good work. Your word further reminds us that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and that no creature is hidden from your sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We thank you, Father, that you desire truth in the inner part and in the hidden part, you will make us to know wisdom. We're further reminded that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. These things we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to get right into today's message, and we're going to discuss uh, what uh, is common among uh, uh, believers and professed believers and more so uh, sinners, and that is running from the truth. And that's a tendency that does happen, that when truth does come, people do run from it. And so we as true believers, we don't run from the truth, we run to the truth. So let's open up our Bibles here in the book of uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and beginning at verse number 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, if you notice something here about the serpent, what serpent? If you go into the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 21, you will see that when the children of Israel disobeyed the Lord, that he sent a plague. And then Moses uh, lifted up a, a brass serpent and said, Any, anyone that looks upon this will be healed or delivered. And then uh, this well, around the time that Moses was uh, was ministering was around three thirteen ninety one uh, B.C. But uh, there was something that took place during Hezekiah's reign, which was around seven hundred and fifteen B.C. in that they took this serpent and they worshipped it and made a god out of it. And uh, Hezekiah had to destroy because its purpose was perverted. And that's one of the things that as a side issue, you need to understand that there are some things in the scriptures that have been perverted. Paul warns of this in the book of Galatians chapter one, where he said that we are not to pervert the gospel. In other words, individuals that would bring another gospel is a perverted gospel. So we have to be very careful not to pervert the things of God. But that's just a reminder of what is said here in the book of uh, John chapter 3 and verse 14, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life continuing in uh, John chapter 3, verse 15. Now verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his, his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And that's one of the things that we have to see in the scriptures, that the reason why people do not want to come to the light is because that their deeds are evil. And so when anyone brings light, 
It brings them out of darkness if they heed that light and take that light to heart, the light of the word of God, and they come out of the darkness. But most people run from the truth. They run from Christ. They run from the, the purpose of the cross. And next thing you know, they are running from the truth. So one of the things that we have to begin to see is that people will run from the truth. Now, why do sinners and professed Christians run from the truth? Well, a false Christian runs from the truth because it's light in terms of what we've seen in the book of John chapter uh, uh, three, verses 19 and 20. So here in John chapter three, uh, John chapter one, rather, and verse three, we're going to see a series of the person of Jesus as the light. All things were made through him and what without him was made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. I have the King James stuck in my mind, which is much better. It's only 12th grade uh, reading, uh, a much better way that they put it. Uh, so now verse four, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now look at the definition of the word comprehend and it means to take eagerly, that is seize, possess, or apprehend. So the darkness could not apprehend or seize or possess the light. Why? Because light is always much more powerful, 100% than darkness. So if we would go back into John chapter one, and uh, we will see uh, in now in verse number six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe he meaning john the baptist was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world and so jesus is that light that came into the world here in the book of john chapter 8 beginning at verse 12 then Jesus spoke to them, saying, again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so we're reminded of, of, of a particular saying that Jesus mentioned in the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 16 and beginning at verse 24. Because if you're going to follow him, you got to follow the light. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange of his soul or for his soul. So if you're going to follow the Lord, you're going to have to lose your life. When you avoid the truth, you're trying to save your life. When you come to the truth, you choose to lose your life. So uh, a lot of people, and I've done this before, and when we're talking about witnessing and sharing the gospel with people, we sometimes say some things that are not really scriptural and not really, uh, uh, not really lining up with the truth. We usually say something like this, that you have nothing to lose when you come to Christ. Well, wait a minute. The scripture is very clear that when you come, come to Christ and you desire to follow Christ, you must lose your life. Now, uh, in terms of after you have done that initially, when you repent of sin and place faith on Christ alone, what what you now do is that you learn the scriptures. Now, John the Baptist, when he was ministering, he lost his life when he told Herod the truth. Well, what was the truth that that he told Herod? He told Herod this. He told Herod that it is unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. In other words, they were committing adultery and it got under his skin and the skin of Herodias. And uh, at later on, uh, their daughter danced before Herod and a group of men. And in my opinion, it was perhaps seductive and it pleased Herod. And he said, I will give you up to half the kingdom. Uh, and then uh, the daughter read back to his mother 
her mother and asked her mother, what shall I ask? And then she said, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. It cost him his life. The Lord gave his life when he spoke the truth. Now, remember when he was crucified? Well, there was a plot that was devised against him by the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders, and they had him killed, not knowing that was part of the plan of Jesus sacrificing his life to save sinners. When you don't want to lose people in the church, you won't tell them the truth. And that's just a side issue, too, that usually when pastors are preaching messages, they're preaching messages to please the people. And when that happens, you're going to gain a whole lot of people. In fact, many of your mega churches are filled with people that really haven't heard or were confronted with the truth. All they were told was that if you say this sinner's prayer, you'll be saved. And a whole lot of people have said a sinner's prayer. But if you notice in the scriptures, not one time did Jesus instruct his disciples to tell the disciples to tell people to say a sinner's prayer to be saved. He told them to tell the people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter four and verse 17, in, in which Jesus started out his ministry. Then if you were to go into Matthew, chapter 10, you will see the instructions that the Lord Jesus gave the disciples, preach to them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And so if anybody tells you to pray a particular prayer to be saved, that's not the correct way to present the gospel. What people need to know is their sin. And we'll get into that later on in terms of how to do the uh, witnessing in a nutshell. It's very simple, very quick, and it's nothing uh, uh, difficult to understand. But nonetheless, what pastors do is that they, they some pastors, not all, uh, they, they preach a message or teach a message that is pleasant to the ears of people. And next thing you know, you got, you got an auditorium filled with a whole lot of people that love what you hear, that love what they hear, rather. And so you have to be very, very careful not to preach a pleasant message in terms of pleasing the ears of many people. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. Now, uh, now notice this in the book of John, uh, chapter nine and uh, verse number four. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, when you see the phrase, the night is coming when no one can work, he is talking about what would happen after his crucifixion. His crucifixion is that time of night and darkness. In fact, if you were to study the uh, Last Supper and uh, how the disciples went into the Garden of Gethsemane and that Jesus was praying and that was the place where he would be betrayed, it was at nighttime. So that this word right here, the night is coming, was fulfilled in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying at night because, remember, that the disciples, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and walked a little further, and Jesus fell down and prayed, and then uh, uh, the, the disciples fell asleep. And so it was at nighttime that Jesus was betrayed, but also the fact that it was the time of his crucifixion, or to be crucified. But nonetheless, he said this in verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of of the world. So Jesus is the light of the world so long as he remains in the world. And, and so you have to be you have to understand that professed Christians are safe when you don't turn on the light. Sinners even are safe when you do not turn on the light, the light of the glorious gospel, which we'll see in a moment. So Paul reminds us in Second Timothy chapter four, beginning at verse one, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, 
Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now, let me point something out to you that notice the uh, things that Paul had mentioned here. He mentioned three things here that sometimes uh, most of us and I've done it myself and, and we get hung up on convincing and rebuking. But we do not do a lot of exhorting or stirring up or encouraging so we have to balance everything out in terms of preaching the message of the Lord or the gospel, preaching the word, is that we have to do three things here. Number one, convince. Number two, rebuke where necessary now, because, you know, you could be sitting in a setting where people really don't need to be rebuked because they haven't done anything wrong. But in terms of, of people doing things wrong, yes, there will be a time and a season for rebuking people, but there will also be a time of exhorting people or, uh, uh, people getting stirred up or being lifted up in terms of, uh, of, um, uh, being encouraged in the things of the Lord. But Peter, uh, excuse me, but Paul says this to Timothy for the time will come, uh, excuse me, the latter portion of verse two with all long suffering and teaching. In other words, putting up with people. And, and that's what long suffering is. In other words, for as long as it take you, and when people cause grief and harm for as long as you take, you lovingly encourage them, but you also lovingly convince and rebuke them with the word of God. And that's why he said what he said in the beginning of verse two, preach the word. Why? Verse three tells us the reason for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers having itching ears. So let me read that again, because I want you to see this. Verse three says, for the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. In other words, they want to hear pleasant things. They want their ears to be tickled. They will heap up for themselves teachers. In other words, they will have a list of individuals that they would rather go to than to hear a pastor give convinced words that convince, rebuke and exhort. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. So that's why they run from the truth. Why? Because they're turning their ears away from the truth. And that's another type or form of running away. So instead of hearing the solid word of God, the sound doctrine of God's word, they would rather turn their ears away from the truth, which again is another sign of showing that they're running from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So that's what they want to do. And that's one of the reasons why people run from the truth. The teachers that they hear have no light and dare not reveal their uh, light, but they practice darkness. Know that their teachers will not turn on the light because they know that their teachers don't walk in the light as he Christ is in the light. And so that's why they turn their ears away from the truth and are turned to fables because they, according to their own desires, they heap up for themselves teachers uh, because they desire, they desire to hear much more pleasant things than a word that convinces a word that rebukes, but also a word that exhorts or encourages. When you're around them, these uh, people and these false teachers, let your yes be yes and let your no be no, because that's the, the myths or fables that people want to hear. They want to hear everything else other than what's yes in the word of God and what's no in the word of God. So anyone that comes to bring these things in and they sit there and they run from the truth, you got to do something more. And that is stay in line with the scriptures. The people that want to hear pleasant things or things that tickle their ears, they don't want to hear what's yes in the word of God or no in the word of God. They want the gray area of the word of God. So anytime a teacher or believers bring this, anything more than these is evil or from the evil one and bring you into judgment. So let's look at Matthew chapter five, verses 33 through 37, which is where we get this from. 
Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. James affirms this in the book of James chapter 5 and verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Sinners run from the light because and uh, sinners run from the light and they command your silence around them. In other words, they want to censor you or they just simply want you to shut up. They want you to turn off your light. Watch what you Uh, that's supposed to be in the light do around your family members. In other words, pay attention to what you're doing when you have family members because you may be the last person that they see before they pass away. And then the regret comes in your heart. I wish I would have said something to them so that way they could be saved and delivered from sin and from the wrath of God that is to come. And so just because they want you to be silent, you can't be silent because of what God has done through his grace or by his grace and by his mercy in your life. And you simply just want them to uh, partake of the same thing so that way they can avoid the judgment and wrath of God. Do not hide your light by being silent or do you or do you turn on the light for them to see? Let your light so shine. And that's what Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter five. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Do we capitulate or collapse or do we compromise to be a peacekeeper when the opportunity to reveal light comes? Blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. There's a difference. A peacemaker is one that simply negotiates and settles with people in terms of the gospel. These are the peacemakers, but the peacekeepers are the ones that are armed. In other words, if any side shoots, they are going to shoot back to be peacekeepers. And so believers are not peacekeepers. We are peacemakers and we do this with the gospel. So as far as running from the light, your family members will run from the light. Your friends will run from the light. And Jesus gives us a reason why here in the book of Matthew uh, chapter uh, 10 and uh, uh, verse uh, number Uh, 32 is where we're going to see a very powerful portion of scripture. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny my before my father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. A whole lot of people want Jesus to to be peaceful and loving. And they all think that Jesus came to bring peace on earth. No, Uh, we misconstrued that passage of scripture in the book of Luke that where the angels that came to announce the birth of Christ peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And so they think that Jesus is coming to bring peace. But look at what Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 10. Now in verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword for I come. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter in law against her mother in law. And a man's enemy will be of those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Let me point something out to you. Uh, uh, I love my wife, (laughs) but I love her less. Why? Because the Lord Jesus is to be loved above her. 
No question about it. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't love her. It only means that I love her less because in the book of Matthew chapter, uh, excuse me, the book of uh, Ephesians chapter five tells us that husbands love your wives. So we are to love our wives. And, and I have no, no question about that. I love my wife. But but you see, I love her less than the Lord because we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In fact, that's the first commandment. We are always to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are not to love our neighbor or our wives or our husband more than the Lord, period. End of discussion. If you have a problem with that, well, just read the scriptures and pray for understanding. So now it goes on to say in verse 37, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And that's another reason why people are afraid of coming to the Lord. And that is because they are afraid of losing their life of sin. They want to keep their life of sin and then even take a little a little further. They want to be able to keep their sin, but have the Lord too. And you can't do that. You cannot do that. You either love the Lord or you love your sin. You cannot have both. So again, in verse 39, Jesus said this, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So what does it mean to lose your life for his sake? It means that you're willing to give the Lord everything that is yours to him and he has it forever and that's how you lose your life you lose your life by giving your life to the lord lose your life so that way you can find eternal life your husband doesn't like the light your your wife doesn't like the light your children don't like the light your in-laws don't like the light Your friends don't like the light. Truth is in the light and exposes what's done in darkness. Here in the book of Ephesians chapter five, beginning at verse eight. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And you see, that's why they don't want you around. And that's why they run from you because you carry the light of the gospel of the image of Christ on the inside of you. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Now, when it's when we talk about awake, we're not talking about woke, which is the doctrine of the world. We're talking about being awake from from the things of the world. You that sleep. If you are asleep, you're not uh, uh, you're not awake. And so Paul reminds us that awake you who sleep arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. So another thing that we have to understand is that people avoid the truth because the word reveals who you really are and what you really stand for. Let me say that again. People avoid the truth. In other words, running from the truth because the word reveals who you are and what you really stand for. Here in the book of first John, chapter one, beginning at verse six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Look at chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation or the atoning self, uh, atoning substitutionary sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And that's why people run from the truth, because they want to claim that they know him, but they do not keep his commandments. They want to be able to say, I know him, but they don't keep his commandments. But when you tell them to keep his commandments, they run from the truth. I, he who says I know him does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So if you run to the truth, you got to walk as he walked. You got to walk in righteousness. And this is done with the help and the aid and power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this ourselves. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, finally, we're going to go into 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse number 14, because in these verses of scriptures revealed to us why we are not to run uh, from the truth, but to stay in the truth. And those that are in the truth, we love the truth. We don't run from the truth. We practice the truth. And so when people run from the truth, it's simply because they are not in him. Because if they were in him, they would never run from the truth. So here in Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, finally, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Look at this word communion. This word communion means partnership. It means partnership. So if you do not have partnership with the Holy Spirit, it's simply because you are in darkness. And what partnership has light with with darkness. There is no partnership with light and darkness. Remember what we saw in the book of John chapter one and uh, the darkness comprehended not. In other words, the darkness doesn't seize it, doesn't grasp it, doesn't understand it, doesn't comprehend it. So darkness will never comprehend the light. The light is separate from darkness forever. And so there is no fellowship or there is, as the definition reminds us, there is no partnership with uh, light and darkness. And what accord has Christ with Belial or worthless? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? No part at all. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? There is no agreement. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. Stop running from the from the truth and run to the truth. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And I love chapter 7 and verse 1 where it says therefore having these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God perhaps you're listening to this message and you may not be saved well the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God now what sins are we talking about how many lies have you said in your life? How many lies have you spoken in your life? 
How many things have you stolen, irrespective of its value? Have you ever used the name of the Lord in vain? You know, that G expletive word that people share in disgust. That's blasphemy worthy of death. And it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. Uh, have you committed adultery? The Bible says that Jesus said that if any man looks upon a woman to lust after her, has committed adultery with her already in his heart. You see, if you did not commit adultery physically, if you look upon a man or a woman with the intent or motivation to lust, you have committed adultery with her or him already in your heart. We're talking about these sins. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter nine, verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die after this, the judgment. So a death is true on one hand. Judgment is true on the other. Hebrews chapter two and verse three says, behold, uh, it, it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Second Corinthians chapter six and verse three says, behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And that's why we command men everywhere to repent to repent means to turn from sin 180 not 360 Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17 repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Peter said this repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out you need to turn from your sins and then place faith on on Christ alone. You see, we don't understand the magnitude of our sin. We will never turn from them and repent or turn from sin and then place faith on Christ alone. You do not have any righteousness of your own. You only have sin. We have to depend upon the righteousness of Jesus. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, he was made to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so uh, we need to repent and place faith on Christ alone. You need to do it today because at the close of business or at midnight tonight, 150,000 people will have perished from off of the face of the earth. You and I may be one of them. So repent and place faith on Christ alone. Do it today because tomorrow is too late. We thank you so much for joining us here on our live stream here at Prevailing Word Ministries. We thank you that you're able to hear the word of God and we pray that you would listen to the admonition, those of you that are not saved, to repent and to place faith on Christ alone. We thank you so much for joining us and until next time, the peace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You've been listening to Prevailing Word Ministries on the Prevailing Word Podcast channel. We're on YouTube, YouTube Podcast, and Patreon. Please visit our website at prevailingwordministries.net. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening.